like to invite you to look with me in Acts chapter 24, which is my text for today. The Lord's directed me to endeavor to preach through this entire chapter just because it's one unit. Sometimes we can lose sight of the subject just by breaking it up into two small pieces. Here, particularly, I believe that we need to consider this as a whole. But I have entitled this the way they call heresy. Here was Paul now being accused by the Jews of being a rebel, not only to their law, but their accusation was even to the law of the government. And so here he is brought, now as we saw in the last chapter, Acts 23, to Herod's judgment hall. This would not have been in Jerusalem, but up in Caesarea, where Herod had places where he would come for judgment, depending on the severity of the charges. Herod, remember, was a Jew, and he served the Roman government government had put him there to help keep the Jews at bay. And so they felt it best to take one of their own, and that's why he was so hated. But it's interesting that even though he was hated by the Jews, because they saw him as a traitor, yet when it came to accusing one over Christ and Christ's gospel, that they would join hands with that one to bring accusation against him. You see, uh, this is a pattern that even our Lord Jesus Christ endured, whereby Herod and Pilate didn't typically get along. But when it came to crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, they were found in agreement. But even that, the Lord purposed. You see that in the book of Acts. That there wasn't one thing that befell our Lord, but what God had already ordained. And Psalm 2 is quoted. Why did the heathen rage? And speaking of Herod and Pilate, says that God sits in heaven and laughs at their derision because in reality what this is is accusations against God himself, against his son. It's the spirit of Antichrist. You ask yourself, well, what would get people so angry that here is a man like Paul that they're willing to put him to death and seek his death rather than to hear what he has to declare, well, it's that same spirit of Antichrist that is in any one of us. Had we been there that day when these crowds were crying, crucify him, crucify him, do you realize they were our representatives? And when you consider again that when Christ died on the cross, if he was paying our sin debt, then my sins nailed him there. My rebellion nailed him there. But none of that deterred our Lord. Because that's exactly why he came, to put away that sin. So though we still have this rebellious heart, yet, as we just sang, Jesus paid it all. All to him, I told. Sin had cast his sinful stain, but he removed it and paid it all. So here in Acts chapter 24 now, we find Paul awaiting this judgment. And... Again, those that are opposed to Christ are not ashamed to use any means by which to attack any that are his. And I will tell you that if we're the Lord, we can expect the same opposition today. That hatred for Christ that is preeminently in everybody, particularly in religion. I know everybody's saying, I love God, or I love Jesus. These are expressions you hear until... They find out who you declare God to be. See, they love a God of their imagination. They love a God, the image of their God, little G-O-D. It's idolatry. And as long as you leave them alone, they're not going to bother you. They'll act like the kindest people in the world. But begin to declare unto them, as is true, that their God really is no God at all. And that the God of Scripture is one who is sovereign and holy 
and just and does what he will. That's where you're going to begin to see that, hey, these that say they love God, they really don't love God. They begin to push back. Their God really is themselves. Their God is their particular will. And they want that determination. They won't have God to determine. They want that determination themselves. And the more you press it, the angrier you're going to see people to a point where, even with Paul, they're going to tell you you're a heretic. Have you ever been called that a heretic by some of these? I have. Simply for declaring God for who he is. That's heresy. Well, that's that rebellion. And that's where Paul here declares a little later on in verse 14. He said, this I confess unto thee. That's where this is all headed. That after the way which they call heresy. And that word heresy is a strong word. It's one that is declared to be a rebel against whatever cause these are following. But he says, in the way which they call heresy. God doesn't call it heresy. God is blessed in hearing those of his own declare his glory. He said, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. He's saying this God that you hate, this Christ that you hate, they hated Christ. They hated, they called him by that name of derision, Jesus of Nazareth, because they considered that to be an insult. They would not have a Christ or a Jesus that didn't fit their view of what he should be. See, they, they wanted a, a Christ that would be raised up, not come down from heaven, but be raised up from among them that would lead them to victory over the Romans. They were thinking purely in terms of a political kingdom, earthly kingdom. And when Paul would declare that not only is the kingdom of Christ not earthly, but spiritual, and that it comprises not just the Jews, but Jew and Gentile, those that God had chosen, therein was their disdain for such a Jesus. You remember they listened to him. We saw that in the, the last chapter until he mentioned the word Gentiles. And as soon as he did, they were an uproar. They said away with him. He's not fit to live. As they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust in the air. Again, you say, well, what would make people so angry? Well, press the matter of who Christ is. Again, there is a Jesus, little Jesus that's being preached, but he's not the Christ of Scripture. They, they want a, a Jesus that fits their view. A Jesus in our day that loves everybody. A Jesus that came and laid down his life for every single person in the world. But alas, unless the sinner gives agreement to Christ, then he can't save them. That's not the Christ of Scripture. Again, it all comes back to who man is. They don't like that doctrine concerning man's depravity, that he has no free will. You want to get people throwing dust in the air, just denounce free will as being false. It doesn't exist. There is no such thing as free will other than with God. God's will is free. But man is depraved. Nothing in this will will ever direct a man to the truth as it is in Christ. So that, that causes, you talk about denying man his so-called free will today, you'll be called a heretic for that reason, such as the opinion that, that man has of himself. But then God's sovereignty, that it's not up to man whether he's going to be saved or not, it's God who has determined. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Start getting people just to read those scriptures and you'll see this disdain. And they'll get agreement from their preachers and others. They'll, the preacher will say, oh, you need to stay away from them. Often they'll say, well, that's that Calvinism. It has nothing to do with Calvinism. Calvin wasn't even around when 
the Lord was declaring these things. He'll save whom he will and he'll condemn whom he will. That's the God of Scripture. And But more particularly, Christ and his death. People are just, they get hyperventilating when you tell them that Christ didn't die for everybody. And nor did he pray for everybody. Even though it's clearly set forth in the scripture. I pray not for the world, he said before he went to the cross. But for those that thou hast given. It's simple. For those that have been given eyes to see. But left to yourself, you're going to find every reason not to believe. And they will call you an heretic. Because it doesn't line up with their blind belief. You have to understand that all this is in play here as we lead up to, this is a trial. Stop and think about if we were called into court, and it may come. More and more we're hearing of rules and regulations and impositions against the word that if you state anything as to this word being the word of God, exclusive, no others, given consideration, it may be cause for being dragged into court. Or with people's lifestyles and how they live, you can't call it sin. That's a word that's not politically correct. It's an alternative lifestyle is what they want to call it. But the scriptures declare it to be sin. It's rebellion against God. And yet right now, the scriptures say to pray for those in authority over us that we might live a honest and peaceful life. I'm thankful for the religious freedom that the Lord has given us to this point. We don't know tomorrow. But just how persuaded are we that this way that the world calls heresy is the way in which we worship God? Would it make a difference if tomorrow we were hauled into court over this? Could we stand even as Paul did here against all opposition and alone, no man stood with him. There again, we see the pattern even with our Lord Jesus Christ. All fled. He stood there as the true witness. And yet it was God the Father that was sustaining him to accomplish an end. And that's the beauty of reading this. Everything we read taking place with Paul here was God's purpose. It was that some here who would otherwise never hear but to see how Paul, by God's grace, stood, because that's what persuasion is. Some people have a preference to believe certain things about Christ, but Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am what persuaded. You can't change a persuasion. That he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What has he committed unto him? His very soul, his very life. Give me Christ or I die. And so this is what we see here. So here in the first two verses, we find him appearing before these prosecutors that were set against him. And Pilate literally being dragged before the bar, the bar of justice. It says after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders. So here we see that uniting together. You've got the Jews, the high priest, Stop and think about it. These were ones that had been given the charge to offer up the lambs to God. But in reality, at this point, when you stop and think about it, Christ had come and paid the sin debt. There was no more reason for these men even to have any influence or role. They should have all packed their bags and gone home and said, it's finished. They should have locked the door of the temple. No more sacrifices being offered. But in their blindness, such was their craving for the power. These were the ones in Israel had the power. Ananias was one of the chief priests. And his blindness continued on the traditions of that temple. The only thing that stopped it was God destroying that temple in AD 70. It was and The Romans were raised up and that temple was raised. And it's been that way ever since. The rules. People still go over there and they have the wailing wall. And you notice them doing this with a stiff neck because they're sitting there. That's their penance. 
They're saying, yes, Lord, we're stiff necked, but please show your mercy and rebuild this temple. You suppose God is going to answer that prayer? That temple is a reflection of Christ and his finished work. And when he finished it, it was finished. There's no more reason for it to exist. But here they are. They were a political wing in of themselves. But they're joining together, it says, with a certain orator named Tertullus. Tertullus would have been a Roman, skilled in the Roman law and language. And so they weren't messing around. They sought the best of the best to bring charges against Paul in this matter. And when it says he was an orator, skilled in his ability to speak so that those that were charging him would, would hear. And yet what is man before God's purpose? It's nothing. So they sought the best. And it says that he came and informed the governor against Paul. In other words, a little sidebar going on with the governor even before he appeared trying to win his favor. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him. That's a strong word. There was no friendly reasoning going on here. This man that stands before you is worthy of condemnation. They were saying, seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. And that's what he's doing. He's not after the truth. He's after winning the favor of this governor. We enjoy great quietness and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. You notice who he's given the glory to, the man. There's not a ruler that is in power position, but what God has placed him there. But rather than give God the glory, he's given the man the glory. This is what a depraved heart will always do. It will look at the arm of the flesh. It will praise man. But God alone is worthy of glory. So he says, we accept it always in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Here again, the smoke continues to rise and, and blind Felix, because Felix is like anybody. He likes to be praised. Men love the praise of men. And the more they're praised and the more the glory goes to them, the more they like others that are giving them that praise. But again, there's no glory being given to God here. So this opening indictment against Paul by Tertullus, he was of the council of the prosecutors. This was their chief spokesman. And what he's doing here as we read on, aggravating the charge, bringing a list of charges against Paul, along with a whole bundle of compliments to the judge and malice to Paul. That's man's way. It says in verse 4, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I'm not going to waste your time, Felix. I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us of thy clemency a few words. So he was seeking clemency for himself, but not for one of the Lord's. He says, for we have found this man a pestilent fellow, a troublemaker. And I'll tell you, that is a common charge against any of us that declare Christ's glory in Christ alone. Because men don't like to be denounced in their professions or in their way of worshiping God. They're going to find you to be the pestilent one. It's like Ahab said of Elijah in his day, he's a troublemaker in Israel. I've been called that a number of times. That you can't get along with Kent. It seems like he's always stirring up trouble. Why? It's not that I'm tempting to go and attack any one person, but it's because of the Christ that the Lord has revealed in me that I preach. Just like with Paul. Pestilent fellow. Notice, a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. Now that's the point that they wanted to bring against 
Paul so that an order of cease and desist would be given. Because they were concerned as Jews that if word got back to Caesar that somehow there was somebody fomenting sedition and trouble that they would send the Roman army in and take them away. So they were thinking of their own well-being and not, again, the glory of God. In fact, he says here, and that's how he's trying to paint him here as a real leader, notice the word, of the sect of the Nazarenes. Where did that expression derive? Sect of the Nazarenes. Well, Christ was Jesus of Nazareth. And so they were trying to minimize these followers of Christ by his grace, identifying with his Jesus of Nazareth, as being a sect. I know, listening to your own testimony, that you have loved ones that have said the same thing about this congregation right there. It's a sect. They say it's a cult. And the reason is because they can't fit it in their mind, and nor do we want to in any way identify with anything that's out there in the world of religion. It's the Lord that calls his own apart, calls them out of that whoredom of religion sets us apart. And the fact that we don't identify with what's going out there, on out there. And it seems that we meet in small numbers. They think, many of them think as they drive by, well, wonder what's going on behind those four walls, but they'll never come in to sit and listen. There's no kind of political messages being preached from here. There's no kind of revolution being promoted against the government or against the side. No. People that come in here and sit and if God will give them ears to hear, they're going to find out one thing. This is all about Christ and him crucified. It's all about that Jesus of Nazareth, which was a term of derision, but with which we identify because it, it identifies the Lord Jesus Christ, though he were God, yet he became man. And in total humility, Nazareth, that's, that was the expression of the day. Can anything good come from Nazareth? But God purposed it that way, that this Jesus not be a popular Jesus, it not be one according to men's fancies. He was as a root out of dry ground growing up in the wilderness that the Lord was pleased to raise up and prosper in his work in the salvation of sinners. But any that identify with him, you can expect, even as our day, the world to consider you to be a sect of the Nazareth. That's let the world say what it is. I'm thankful to be called a sect of the Nazareth because that means that I'm shut up holy to the Lord Jesus Christ alone, not to any work of man or any organization of man. There are those that say, well, you can't exist if you're not tied with some earthly organization. People. That's what they want to know. They, they, they're always asking, well, okay, it says Shreveport Grace Church, but who do you, who, who are you really under? What's your, what's your identification? It's Christ is our head. We meet and worship him alone. Oh, so you're non-denominational? Well, no, it's got a name. Non-denominational means doesn't have a name. Now, we've got a denomination. It's just not an earthly organization. Our name is Christian. That's who we are. Don't be afraid of that name. It's been abused, but I'm a Christian. I'm identified with the Lord Jesus Christ and his person working his day. See, they're always trying to figure out what sets you apart. They not like try to pigeonhole you into one camp or another. Well, no, we're, we're just separated under Christ. And I'm happy to have it that way. But it says here in verse 6, again, these are all false accusations. Anybody that's going to find any reason to argue against you, he's got to find a false accusation because they're opposing the truth. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, it wasn't for anything that he declared and said that they crucified him. He said, for what good work do you seek to put me to death? And they said, it's not for a good work. They weren't opposed to his miracles and healing and other things that he went about doing, but that you being a man, he says, make yourself equal with God. You stop and think about for us to worship Christ. He is God. 
And everything about him reflects that divinity. See, this little Jesus is not God that men worship. They call him Jesus, and yet he has no power. Unlike God, that God, when he declares, it's done. He not only has the will, but the, the power to do what he will do. That's God. But this little J-E-S-U-S, they can't do anything unless you let him. And is hoping that men will cooperate with him so he can get his work done. That's not the Christ of Scripture. So there again, what men call Jesus is really not the Christ of Scripture. Here's one that rules and reigns and has all things in his hand. Everything's on its head today. They got a Jesus that is in man's hands to do whatever man will, but that's not the way it is. Christ himself in his prayer there in the garden, a high priestly prayer, thanked the Father that the Father had given him authority over all flesh, whether they're believers or not, all flesh, but it says to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. Such is the Christ of Scripture. He cannot fail. But the little Jesus that's being preached is a failed Jesus. Little J is here. Here they accuse him in verse 6, who also have gone about to profane the temple. Ah, there it is. Again, that temple had no more value. Why? Because Christ came and fulfilled it and would ultimately destroy it. But they found that blasphemous that Paul would preach against that physical temple in declaring, even as Peter declared, we're not redeemed by silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no more lamb to be offered by way of sacrifice. All the lambs up to the point of Christ's death were symbolic of the work that Christ would accomplish, but they missed it. They didn't hear when the last prophet that God raised up in John the Baptist that declared, behold, the lamb to take the way of sin of the world. And for that, because he would not give any credence to their continuing to offer sacrifices and all the activities of that temple, that they found him to be a blasphemer. But it was just the opposite. It's one thing for man to call you a blasphemer. It's another thing for God to declare you a blasphemer. And who are the blasphemers but those who continue to bolster and hold up by the traditions and their gifts and all of these things that represent false religion against Christ and his finished work. It's finished. Christ declared that from the cross. cross. It is finished. Nothing more to be accomplished than by his death. But that was their point of contention. We face it today. Even among those that say that they believe, they like to use the word sovereign grace. Beware when you hear that term. Oh, there's a sovereign grace work here. There's a sovereign grace work there. That is meaningless. If it's not Christ in his work, you can preach all kinds of doctrine on the gravity of man, the sovereignty of God. But there is today, even in the, among those that, that say they believe in sovereign grace, there is a spirit against the truth that when Christ finished the work, it was finished. They believe that somehow, and they'll say, well, it's God that gives the faith, but they still say that it, faith is required to get the work done. So in essence, you have a preaching up of man's faith, even though they say, that, well, it's God that gives it, but it's still one step removed from what Christ declared. See, faith is the fruit of what Christ accomplished at the cross. You pull up the anchor. From Christ and his death and what he accomplished there, you're going to be afloat with all kinds of different teachings. Call it what you will, but it's not the gospel. The gospel is the sum total of the revelation of God concerning Christ, who he is, and what he accomplished when he came into this world and earned and established that righteousness necessary to satisfy a holy God. And he paid the sin debt. Period. That's the sum of it. Paul gave that description there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 that he was made to be sin. That means charged with 
the sin of those that he came to save, yet without sin, he knew no sin, that we might be made the very righteousness of God in him. Therein is the gospel. Don't try to add anything to it, man's decision, man's will. Say, well, that, that's true for our justification, but now for our sanctification, that's something we really got to be working on. Now, well, Christ declared, even regarding his death, I sanctify myself for them. Our sanctification, if we're the Lord's, was accomplished just like our justification, just like our redemption and our glorification was accomplished. And Christ finished the work there at Calvary. There remained nothing more than for God to once for all impute that righteousness to the spiritual account of everyone for whom he paid the debt. But I'll tell you, there's people that will wrestle with that. You know, there's always something more, always something else. And they want you busy about doing it. So they... Just like these in this day. It says there whom we took and would have judged according. Notice this. Our law. Had Paul been judged by the law of God. He would have been found blameless. Why? Because Christ finished the work. But see men judge you by their law. By their traditions. And if it doesn't fit what they think and say. Then they're going to find fault with you. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us. It says there, and again, that's going back to where they were getting ready to tear Paul apart back then on the steps of the prison. So Lysias, the Lord purposed that he intervene, came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands. They're finding fault with everybody. Otherwise, this wouldn't even be an issue, Felix. We would already have him dead. But God preserves his own. God had already, in calling Paul out, determined that he should suffer many things, but that the gospel should be preached. Men aren't going to keep God from doing what he's purposed to do. And so he says, commanding his accusers to come unto thee. In essence, uh, this Tertullus is throwing Lysias under the bus. He was a Roman as well commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. There you see where this is headed. And so in verse 9, we see him corroborating now this charge by the testimony of the witnesses or the prosecutors themselves. It says, and the Jews also assented. Here is, he's trying to show that the, the majority is against this man, and therefore he ought to be condemned. Be, beware of majority votes. There are a lot of congregations that like they take a vote to determine which direction they ought to go. Well, they took a vote back there in the wilderness. You know, those 10, the 12 spies came back, and 10 of them voted not to go into the land. There's your majority. But I'll tell you, the truth is not with the majority. It's not so today. Don't think that this is not the truth that we follow just simply because there's more cars and parking lots elsewhere, other places where people go for their worship. The truth has never been in the majority. Go back and read it all the way from Genesis all the way through. It's the Lord. The majority is always in corruption and disbelief and antichrist. The minority, that's the remnant. Those are the ones that the Lord has been pleased to preserve and his mercy and separate out. But here he's pleading on this basis. Again, reasoning with natural reasoning why this Felix, the governor, ought to condemn Paul. Stop and think too, it was a majority that condemned our Lord Jesus Christ. When Pilate threw it out there and gave him the choice, who would you have, Barabbas or Christ? They all said, release Barabbas. They're willing for the worst of the worst to be released. But him, crucify Crucify Thankfully, God doesn't leave any of his own up to man's choice and decision. But he himself rules and directs. So here, in verse 10, we see Paul's defense. This is the beautiful 
defense that we find here. If you want to know, put in that same situation, how you would answer this, you can't do better than this. Then Paul, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, you don't find Paul in any way disrespectful with these his accusers. He himself declared that there's not a, a one in power that exists, but what God has ordained. It. And so he's submissive to this, believing that God's working even through this. Paul, after that, the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. See the difference between the way Paul is speaking? It's not with flattery. He's recognizing his office. He's recognizing that God had put him there to judge such matters. And so now he is thankful to be able to freely answer on his behalf, as God would direct him and not based upon these false accusations. He says, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man. He said, I did not go there with the idea of trying to overthrow their way and their tradition, neither raising up the people. This was the accusation. He was a revolutionary. He was a seditionist. Neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Paul is willing to bow to whatever truth may be said, but not to agree to any false accusation. They can't prove it. But after this, but this I confess unto thee, that after the, the way, notice that, he's speaking there of Christ, which they call heresy, so worship I the God, notice he doesn't say of our fathers, there are other Jews there, but of my fathers. Paul is declaring that in how he's declaring Christ, he's not saying anything more than Abraham, Jacob, or Isaac would have confessed, were they here? Because even the Lord said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. But this is not some new doctrine. It may seem new to your ears, it's like so many that will tell you when you're pointing them to Christ through this word, they're like, where are you getting this? Well, it's right there in the word. You open it and read it regularly. Can you be so blind as not to see that everything in this scripture going all the way back from Moses all the way forward has to do with this Christ and the death that he accomplished? That's what he says. He's not basing this upon thought or reasoning of his own. He says, believing all things which are written in the law of the prophets. There's some that are surprised that were I never to open the New Testament again and simply spend the rest of my days preaching from the Old Testament, I would preach nothing but Christ and him crucified. Because it's all there. It's what the law of the prophets declare. And people are shocked. Because they're shocked because they're still blind. He says, and have hope toward God. You see hope, that's hope in Christ. Hope toward God, that, which they themselves also allow. That word is stronger than what we're seeing there, allow, which they themselves also preached. Peter declared that, that the spirit of Christ that was in them, those prophets of the Old Testament, they declared the suffering that Christ should endure and the glory that should follow. I, I'm just like some of these. In my blindness, I was trained in, in theological studies to read the Old Testament, but not to see Christ there. It, there they would talk about certain messianic portions that, okay, this, this, that, but not to see at all pertaining to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, Paul's declaring, which they themselves also allow. This same Christ, this same Jesus of Nazareth, that now I'm being called before this council to answer to, is the same that all of these that claim to believe the Old Testament scriptures, these fathers that they own, they declare nothing different. 
There's one message in all the scripture, Old and New Testament. That's all they had when Paul was preaching. They all, all they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament was written over time, affirming what was already declared in the Old Testament. But here again, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. One resurrection. Both of the just, that is, the justified ones. How is one justified except in the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the unjust. Who are the unjust? That's those for whom Christ didn't pay the debt. That one resurrection. When Christ raised from the grave, he took with him the glory, everyone for whom he paid the debt. And their names are written on them. The breastplate of Christ is the high priest. That's where he ever lives in her seat. You see, that went contrary. Even the, the word resurrection went contrary to what the Sadducees believed. They weren't even in agreement among themselves. The Pharisees said there's a resurrection. The Sadducees said, no, we just live for the time. And so he says in verse 16, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Notice how he begins, toward God. A conscience void of offense means that in my conscience, I know that what I'm declaring is the very word of God. And it's everything that God himself has declared concerning his son. You can go to sleep at night knowing that regardless of the opposition of sinners against this message. But when he says void of offense toward men, he's speaking of the fact that though they will not hear this message, yet I can in good conscience declare unto them that I've preached for their good and God's glory, whether they're not here or not. The way to do that is by simply, as Paul said, I determined not to know anything save Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ. You've heard me use that illustration. It's not original with me, but uh, the, the man that only had one string on his guitar, he was playing away, and someone asked him, how do you play a guitar just with one string? He said, well, it's hard to mess up with one string. And that's, it's hard to mess up. When your only message, and I've had some come here, sit for a while and go and, and leave, and they say, so that's all you're going to preach? Yeah, it doesn't matter what the text is. It's God gives me strength and grace. When I begin studying the scriptures, whether old or new, I'm looking for Christ. I'm looking for his finished work. And I'm looking to preach in a manner, even as Paul says here, of a conscience void of offense toward God. You talk about an offense toward God, it's preaching anything but his son. That's an offense toward God, and it's an offense toward men because you're withholding from them the very thing they need to hear. And you're over here talking about tithes and offerings and witnessing and all of this stuff, building the church. I get people asking me that all the time. Well, has your church grown since you started preaching there on that little corner? Well, I trust it's grown in Christ. It's not numbers. It's as many as the Lord himself has ordained. And if we're of that number, you suppose no one in his family would complain about only being eight in the ark? I mean, they're thankful. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is a sheepfold. Goats will come in and brood for a while and then they'll butt, you know, they'll butt, butt this, butt that, and then they're out the door. Let them go. The Lord knows those are Jesus. And I'm thankful to be of this number. That's how this, as Christ is declared, void of offense toward God and toward men. Preach that which God himself is glorifying and hearing. After many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. When he's talking about alms, he's talking about gifts. Remember, he was out gathering up these gifts from the Gentile nations to come and give to those that were in Jerusalem that were suffering. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia, you talk about pursuing him, they were dogging him the whole way. From Asia, found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult. Who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. So go find them. Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me, while I stood before the council, 
except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them touching the resurrection of the dead I am called in question by you this day again it comes back to the truth as it is in Christ Paul himself declared that in 1 Corinthians 15 if Christ died and there be no resurrection then your faith is vain if you want an idea of what he preached and declared, read 1 Corinthians 15. I know we talk about Christ and him crucified, but vital to that death is his resurrection. If Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. But we declare it. Now it says here in verse 22 and 23, when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, it's interesting that Felix himself was not ignorant. That he would have been a governor who would have heard, notice, of that way. He was perhaps even in this position of power even when Christ was going around preaching, sending his disciples around preaching. It says here that he was not ignorant when Felix heard heard these things having more perfect knowledge. It doesn't mean that he was converted, but in his mind there had been enough light to know that this is not something that I can handle. It's like Pilate, when it came to crucifying Christ, he wanted to wash his hands of him, but couldn't. God had purposed otherwise. And so even here, Felix, he's, he's wanting to adjourn. And Continued to put Paul in custody. It said he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down. So let's go back to Lysias. Whether Lysias intended to get involved in this trial or not, he's being sunk. He said, I'll know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty. Isn't that amazing? The tenderness which even here the Lord directed through Felix, that he would be kept, but he would be kept with liberty, not bound in chains, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. You've heard me say before, you can bind the preacher, but you can't bind the word. That's why I say that here's where Paul was in submission to God in all things, and even while he was here, and it would appear from verse 27 where it says he was there for two years. Two years in prison waiting for the next person to come, Festus. What do you suppose he was doing during those two years? He was speaking to everyone that the Lord brought his way. But there was an elect among them, one of those lost sheep that would not have heard had it not been for this particular path. That was the Lord put it. Oh, we should never, never question God's ways. Even when the way seems to be narrow and straight and got opposing winds, that the Lord is using it all to his glory. So after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Jerusalem, but here's a private conversation. It, this is amazing that he could not leave it alone. This is outside the contact. This is off the record, as they say. He brings his wife, which was a Jewess, and he sent for Paul. And what does it say? Heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Who would have thought? And yet here was, that's why Paul called himself Christ's prisoner. Prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, not, not of the Roman government. And as he reasoned, the righteousness, what righteousness do you suppose that is? That, that's that of the Lord Jesus Christ that he earned and established and God imputed there to the cross. Temperance, in other words, everything can pertain to Christ tempers who we are by nature. We would be otherwise just like these others, but here's the grace of God. And judgment to come, declaring that if one is not one of those for whom Christ paid the debt, then there remains nothing but everlasting separation from God. He wasn't afraid, even in private conversation, to continue to declare the same message. It says Felix trembled been a lot of trembling over this word, but even trembling does not mean conversion. It can shake sinners to the core. And the Lord purposes that way. 
but you can see left to himself, he answered, go thy way for this time. Notice, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. There's no indication that he ever called for him again. There's no convenient season. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. That's what the scriptures say. We just assume we have tomorrow. Some of you may be sitting listening to me right now today. Now, gotta give us some more thought. It, you don't have to. If the Lord leaves you there, then you'll know nothing but condemnation. This isn't our choice. It's not our determination. There again, it's the way they call heresy. These men want the choice. I'll decide. No, you won't. God decides or else you'll not know it. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul. Interesting men's motives by he's schmoozing with him. While we're here in private, Paul, if you've got something you want to give, that's not how God deals. You don't buy him off. Then he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. But it wasn't to hear his message. It was thinking that if I let this go long enough, pretty soon he's going to bribe me. That's all they live for, bribes. You can bribe men, but you can't bribe God. Men think so. They think that God is every bit like they are. God's justice is strict. Christ's death wasn't a bribe, it was a payment to satisfy God's law and justice. And for two years, it says there, Portius, Festus came unto Felix. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul now. Well, we'll move on with that, Lord willing, next time. The Lord be pleased to show us what a grace it is to be identified with that way that they call. Harrison.